Just waiting for some students to come in. But yeah, I think we can kind of get started. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our Art Schools US versus UK panel today. My name is Aditi, and I'm very excited to be your moderator for this event. Um, for those of you who are tuning in to a Millie event for the first time, uh, Millie is a company dedicated to building a community for international school students globally. And to that end, we host webinars and panels like this almost every weekend. And you can find an archive for all of our past events, as well as a schedule for our future events on our website, www.milligroup.com. And if you want to keep up to date with what we have to offer, be sure to follow our Instagram at Millie underscore group. Um, okay, so here's kind of a little bit about how today's panel will look like. Um, we have some pre-prepared questions. Um, but students, please feel free to keep submitting your own questions throughout, and I'll make sure to get to them. Um, yeah, the kind of uh, the questions that you submit can be for one panelist or to all panelists, totally up to you. Um, but yeah, uh, that's kind of how it will work today. And yeah, I think we can just go ahead and get started. So um, could we start with a quick intro from each panelist? Could you tell us uh, your name, the city you're currently in and uh, or from, and one fun fact about yourself. Christina, if we could start with you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina. I'm currently in Los Angeles, California. Um, I grew up, I was also an international student. I grew up in Hong Kong, Malaysia. I was born in South Korea. Um, and a fun fact about myself is that uh, I used to have a British accent. Uh, hi, I'll, I'll go next. Uh, my name is Veronica and I'm a graphic and branding designer currently, well, physically currently in Porto, but uh, based in London. I am originally from Poland um, and in my current role, I'm a designer at Google Creative Lab. Um, I guess a, a fun fact about myself would be that um, before we connected here today, um, my boyfriend was walking around the house just in <laughs> pants only. So he's very non cooperative uh, today. So here it is. Hi, everybody. I'm Mark. I'm from Singapore, currently in Singapore. Uh, yeah, so yeah, Mike uh, went, moved to New York and worked there for a couple of years. And then, uh, fun fact. I can play the bagpipes. Is that a fun fact? <laughs> yeah, that's it yeah. for me. That's definitely a fun fact. I've never, I don't think I've ever met anyone who can play the bagpipes before. It's a, it's it's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, so uh, uh, the next question that I wanted to ask, um, uh, I think Mark, you touched on this, but um, where did each of you go to art school and what did you study um, while you were there? So I went to the Rhode Island School of Design um, for undergrad and um, I started painting. I did, uh, I did my BA in Poland, so it was the Academy of Fine Arts in Gdańsk, and then my MA I did in uh, University of the Arts London, London College of Communication, and I studied uh, graphic and media design. I did my undergraduate at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. Yeah, and I did graphic design. Okay, hey, perfect. Um, and yeah, my next question would be, uh, there's so many like different types of art um, and areas you can specialize in. Like you said, we have I think two graphic design, one in painting. Um, what are the areas uh, you are like focusing on now post you know, university and how did you maybe decide um, or land up on that area? Why did you choose that specific place to specialize in? So um, I actually work in an immigration law firm in Los Angeles, and right now I help um, artists get artist visas. Um, it's kind of an interesting trajectory, to be really honest with you. I didn't, if you had told me that this is where I would be right now in my life, like five years ago, I would have been like, no way. 
Um, so I think in life, things kind of take, you know, your path kind of turns in interesting directions and somehow I kind of ended up here. But my what I studied in painting um, has really helped me with this job because I really understand the industry really well. So I know what these artists are going through and it really helps. It, there's a tremendous value that I bring into the whole process um, that, you know, somebody who's just from the legal field cannot. Um, but but yeah, here I am. But I also do still practice art. So I, I, I'm still a painter. Um, I'm still a fine artist. Um, that's something that I do um, on my side. But my full time job is working at this uh, immigration law firm. I love this story, Christina. I think I think I will have a lot. I, I, once we get through our questions, I will have questions about this because uh, that sounds fascinating um, for my answer. Obviously, to all the design students, graphic design is such a vast area right now. Um, and I always gravitated towards typography and uh, layout and more experimental, experimental typographic practice. Um, and I think this, I can still continue that, um, doing that in my current role. It's in a different environment than what I was doing as a student, because obviously you have a brief and you have certain tasks you need to do. But I'm trying to uh, bring my passions as much as I can into my day to day work and bring those methods into my daily life. Yeah, I'm so it's similar. I'm, I'm focusing more on branding in general. So I think in school, I kind of like to touch like many different things like motion or like publication or type or even like generative like coding stuff and so it's just like wanting to touch so many different things that it's very hard to just do one thing so in branding when you're working with brands different all the different brands have all different uh, wants and different needs and it's also kind of fun to be able to do all the different things that you want to do uh, and then because now I'm working at a, I was working at an agency. I just recently quit, moved to a, a social enterprise, but it's also given me space to have my own site, like freelance business. So I could, I can like do all these different projects and pick and choose clients in that way too. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Um, and uh, kind of now moving into like maybe more academic based questions. So I just wanted to ask, each of you, because this is maybe something that students are really interested in, um, you know, this idea of like art portfolio. So um, did you have to create, first of all, did you have to create a portfolio when you were applying to your art school? Um, and if so, uh, what are some of your key portfolio tips for students planning to apply to art schools? So yes, um, I don't think you can, most schools, most art schools, from my understanding, require um, applicants to submit a portfolio. Um, I actually only applied to one art school, which is the school I decided to go to. Um, but even to liberal arts schools that have art programs, they, you know, a lot of them still require that you um, submit a portfolio. Um, the tip, the biggest tip that I could give is probably um, quantity over quality. Oh, sorry, sorry, the other way around. Quality over quantity, my bad. <laughs> um, and really just look into what the art school is looking for because different schools look for different things. Um, and it's uh, another tip I would give you um, is right now everything is virtual and um, there might be some as an international as international students it's hard to participate in portfolio reviews um, in the United States because of distance wise. Um, but you might be able to tune into some virtual event portfolio reviews um, that are given by the actual institutions themselves so that's something that you might want to look into. Um, but also just reaching out to this the school and just sometimes just just communicating with them and you know looking at student works and. Um, and yeah, but but really just knowing where you're applying and what they're looking for, I think is is really important. Yeah, and I would what I would add to that um, also. So I, in all of my schools, I had to apply with a portfolio as well. Uh, in the UK, it was 
I think in the UK it was a digital portfolio, but in Poland we actually had three day long exams uh, stretching from painting and drawing to, to design exams. Um, I would say, especially for UK schools, um, also depending what uh, course you want to do, but a lot of the tutors don't necessarily want to see just the finished results, but they want to see the process. They want to see what the problem was and how you got there. Uh, so sometimes putting things that are unfinished, but that somehow influence the uh, ending, that's, that can work in your favor. And then another thing would be, I guess, because it's so hard when you're applying and when you're a student and often you just don't know what they want. Um, so I wouldn't really, I wouldn't really worry and try to copy what your friends are doing, but try to put the work that you are excited about and that you feel is a good representation of yourself as a creative, um, because that. I think copies never work well and then they can they can see if you have put your heart in it so that that would be my tip i guess whatever they said no, but, uh, i think yeah it's important to kind of think about the process behind your work is what veronica is saying too um that i think a lot of the like technical skills you learn in schools to like drawing classes painting classes they really want to see kind of um, your ideation process so like how you get from one place to another place and also like all your unfinished work but you're like really passionate about that showcases who you are uh, I think those are important as well yeah I had a very interesting process I didn't even submit my portfolio yeah I came to Singapore and then they saw my work up at, when I was at, at like my exhibition in school and then they just approved it from there so <laughs> I didn't really submit anything um, but just from like what I've seen I think yeah process is important. Yeah, wonderful. That's great advice from all three about, um, you know, uh, how to go about doing your portfolio. So yes, yeah, students, like if you want to ask more questions about that, feel free. Um, but yeah, the next question that I had is, um, do you have also any other tips about like the other parts of the art school application, like maybe the personal statement? Um, because maybe that's not as um, like, uh, clear cut uh, to approach as maybe doing portfolios? Yeah, so um, I can only speak for my school because um, I've, uh, you know, but um, I know at the school that I, I went to, it's the, uh, the, the biggest part of your application is your portfolio. That takes a heavy percentage in um, what they're looking for. Um, you know, obviously your academics, you know, they help, um, you know, getting good grades. It's it's like that with every any other application. In regards to the personal statement, um, I would kind of, my advice would be do something creative, you know, don't, uh, don't be afraid to show yourself, take, take, um, I would say take risks because you, you got to realize that the people that are reviewing these are reviewing like 20, 30 of these a day. And um, oftentimes if it's, if it's, you know, if you write something that's, you know, just very compelling or just very creative or just different, it's just going to grab that person's attention. So I and and or or the personal statement could be a really good opportunity for you to um, let the the person reviewing your application know something else about you um, that you think is really important that, um, you know, is not being shown through your work or any other parts of your application. So it might be something that you went through or something that really changed your life, whatever it may be, um, just being very, um, very, you know, don't look, don't look outside, I would say look inside and um, just try to personalize it as much as you can and, and also just kind of have fun with it. And I would say take risks because, yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, I don't. Oh my God, I don't remember what I wrote in my personal statement. I think I think when it comes to the whole application process, uh, personal statement was was probably secondary to to the portfolio preparation. Um, but I would say, because first it's college application, and then you will likely write something similar for your job application, and so those personal statements would continue with you. I would say it's probably always good to write specifics rather than general things so 
um, avoid avoid writing that you're a team player or you're creative or you're brave, but just tell. So like Christina said, tell a story that's unique to you that demonstrates this quality. Um, it is really it is really a game because a lot of those people are looking at 20 or 30 applications daily. Um, and it, it's hard to write something when you're just beginning. But uh, I think if you can just write something from from your heart, as cliche as it sounds, uh, uh, that that might that might help. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, on the work side of things, uh, it's also since everything is online, it's always very important to kind of document your work properly. Like I think have proper lighting, because I think the only way they're gonna look at your work is through the photographs. And so if you're taking photographs in very dim lighting and you can't really see much, then you're not, you're not doing yourself a favor either. So just try and get things uh, taken to a, like a decent level where you can look at the picture and can tell the artwork from uh, through there. Um, with personal statements as well, I'd say if like English isn't your first language, and it's like a kind of a thing with like US and UK schools where the people reviewing your work are probably like only speak English or they speak English and another dialect that isn't your language. Um, it's also, I think it's helpful to get someone who is more fluent in uh, English or in the UK or if other places, um, depending on the language that is, to kind of review um, your work. Because sometimes a lot of your ideas are really good, but when you try to translate it yourself, it doesn't capture the essence as well. Um, and, it's, and it's like sometimes when you read your, your, your personal statement and they they don't get the idea because it doesn't come through it even though it's like you have the ideas and it's there it's just you can't really express it in a language that isn't your own so i think it's important to kind of find someone who's more fluent in it and then get them to read through it to talk to them in your own language and try to get them to like understand where you're coming from and try to convey it as best you can to uh, another language yeah that's really great advice um okay cool uh so the next kind of question I wanted to ask um, is kind of what was like the format of your classes or lectures at um, art school? Like, could you maybe describe a typical day? Um, and yeah, talk about maybe even you can go into like the grading structure and what, what that was like. Yeah, so at RISD, um, the first year is the foundation year. And so every student that goes to RISD, you take this foundation no matter what um, uh, you go into, major, sorry, you go into. So um, we had three classes. It was called Spatial Dynamics. Now I think it's called Experimental. Some, it's got a different name, but it was Spatial Dynamics when I was there. Uh, we had drawing class and 2D slash design. Um, they're all eight hours long. <laughs> and, then in, and then we had um, two art history classes and an English class. Um, and we were having lectures in between those eight hour classes. Um, we had a lot of homework. It was very rigorous. Um, and so that was kind of the first year. Um, at RISD, you have something called winter session, which is really awesome. Um, it's, we have two semesters and in between, we have like a five week uh, session where you just take one or two classes, depending on, you know, what fits your schedule. And it's, it's a great time because you can, um, Take classes with grad students, other um, other people from other grades, and it's just like a really really fun time. Um, and then once you get into your major, then you know then you take the foundation year of the major. RISD was pretty structured in that way. Um, so for painting, you know we again we had the studio. We had two studio classes, um, and there were there were about five hours each. They were so they, they went down a little bit. Um, and then you just take drawing, you take all these other um, things. And then on top of that, you get to choose your liberal arts classes. Um, at RISD, you can also do concentration. So I did a concentration in the ooh, history, philosophy. I, it's like, it's called HIPS, but it's like social sciences. Um, the other thing about my school in particular was that um, we have a relationship with Brown University. So um, there was cross registration was permitted, it's kind of hard sophomore year, but definitely junior and senior year. Um, so a lot of RISD students were taking Brown classes as long as the schedule permitted. Um, and then some Brown students would take RISD um, classes too. So um, in terms of grading structure, um, we did have, a, you know, we were given letter grades. Um, it's a little, I always find it's, it's a little weird to be grading art <laughs> because it's like, 
you know, it's not like you get you take a test and well, I mean, liberal arts classes, you 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 would get a grade for it, kind of what you would similar to how things would go in high school. Depending on the class, you'd have quizzes, you have presentations, you have essays you submit. But in terms of uh, in terms of uh, grading for class, it's you know maybe it's it's with it's reading. So um, in your in my painting class, we did a lot of reading. Um, every time we would talk about them, um, we had really really long critique sessions. So this is when you are um, talk you you put your work up and then you're talking about other people's works. So it's not just about you know you making good work. It's about your progress. Um, it's about um, how much effort you put into it. Your ideas. Um, you know your critical thinking skills. I feel like I, I studied painting, but a lot of the things I learned was just critical thinking skills <laughs> and critic and, and creative problem solving. Um, so I'm kind of I'm assuming that's all of those kind of factors that um, boil down to a letter grade. The exact science behind it, it's kind of a mystery to me. But um, I think um, yeah, those are the factors that um, I think professors are looking for um, when they're grading. But I'll stop talking now. <laughs> Um, so for me, I think for me, it might be different to, to both of you because I did, I did a postgraduate course, which are usually a bit shorter and with a slightly different structure, at least in the, in the UK, it's different when you're doing BA and MA. Um, so my, my course uh, was uh, divided between three units. Um, unit one and two were full of uh, different exercises, um, either individual or group exercises, workshops, lectures, um, tutorials, so all those, all those things. And I believe that the sort of common goal was to maybe extend our knowledge or push us this way or the other uh, into the areas that we aren't were knowledgeable about or um, weren't as accustomed to. In London also, I don't know if it's the same in the US, but in London, um, MA courses are often filled with um, filled with people from outside uh, outside of England and outside of Europe. So a lot of we have a lot of Asian students and these are people for whom English language is not their first language. So a, a lot of a lot of the concepts and lectures um, for us coming from all over the world, these were quite new and also quite culturally different. Um, when it comes when it comes to grading, all oh right, and then the unit, the final unit, unit three. This is more about your personal research and your personal project. Each student uh, doing an MA course. It's quite it's quite similar to what you do when you're doing a PhD. So you have a goal in mind. There is a certain area that you're researching. I was researching um, interpersonal attraction through typography, so psychological matters through typography. And it sounds it might sound boring, but you're actually researching, experimenting. So you are doing screen printing, letterpress, whatever. Uh, so that third unit is uh, more for yourself and for that final research so you're thinking about what will the outcome be and the grading stuff the grading to be honest I loved because uh, in the UK uh, when they grade you each grade so a letter grade you have a final grade so let's say it's A or B and each of those has like six or seven subgrades which form that end grade so they're judging things like innovation and creativity of course but they're also judging things like academic knowledge uh, research structure and this was to me it was so different because in Poland everyone just gets A's for everything so this like that mathematical formula was so different and I loved it because you feel that uh, the tutors really need to uh, go through your work I really need to understand it. Okay, I'll just touch a video briefly, but I think I'm kind of similar to Christina's where the format is kind of like that. Um, but the grades, I think, really depend on the teacher. T different teachers, different like professors have different criteria. Some of them put more emphasis on like weekly progress. Some people put, some of them put more on uh, classroom participation. So it really depends on the, the professor. Um, but I think one thing that they always look out for is progress. So even if you go in really technically good um, and you just keep doing the same standard, usually you won't get 
that high of a grade because they really want to see you progress. And even if it's trying something different or pushing your ideas a bit more, they like to see that kind of progress. So if someone who's like technically not great, but throughout the course, they approve, improve a lot, like they will get a good grade too. So it's, it's really about learning and trying to figure out your know, kind of who you are as an artist, I guess. Um, yeah, and that Micah too is similar, uh, again, to like RISD, where we have like relationships with like Hopkins and Loyola, so you can take classes there. So I had a friend who really wanted to do medical illustration, but you needed like an anatomy cor course or something. So he could go to Johns Hopkins where you have like a medical campus to really learn like anatomy and then learn how to do medical illustration there. So yeah, I can kind of jump around here and there, which is nice. Yeah, that's really great. I think each of you gave a really great overview. I wanted to just ask because Christina talked about like her schedule and it seemed very intense, like eight hour days and stuff like that. So I was interested, um, Veronica or Mark, were your schedules also as kind of intense or was it a little bit more kind of um, maybe more like one hour sessions because typically when students go to university there's like one hour lectures but yeah just interested Veronica and Mark if you can answer that. Um, so I would say that for us it especially during uni three it was um, even like 16 hour days but that's mostly because during MAs um, you're the one in charge so like when those deadlines are approaching it turns into a 16 hour day but uh, in the beginning and when it comes to classes um, I think the schedule our schedule wasn't as um, as busy so we would have one hour of lectures and then let's say like three to four hours of workshops and tutorials yeah I mean, if you think about eight hours, it seems like a lot, but when you're like doing like painting or you're drawing or you're doing stuff, it isn't that much time, like anyway. And I think at, at Micah, you kind of have like a little bit of control of your schedule because you're like booking, you're like bidding for classes at different time slots. So you can pack uh, like a 12 hour day of putting like two, six hour classes there, or you could just pick one class and then just space out your like work week. Uh, but yeah. Roughly, it's about six hours. Depends on the teacher, too. Sometimes it's a six-hour class, but you have, like, one-hour lecture, five-hour work. Sometimes the teacher will feel, be, like, great, and they do, like, they split the class in half. So the first half for three hours, like, one half of the class, the next three hours, the other half of the class. So you have, like, half that, that six-hour period, like, free. Um, but, yeah, six hours seems like a long time, but when you're actually in it, it's, sometimes it's not, not enough time. Yeah. It's just kind of crazy to me because like six hours is just one day for me <laughs> and six hours becomes like one lecture is, yeah, that's um, amazing. So, uh, okay, cool. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, each of you this question so that we can maybe compare schools a little bit more as well. Um, were there any like basic ideals or foundations that your art school followed that was very like specific to that school itself? Um, and yeah, just wanted to like, check about that and do do you think that every art school has like some kind of like ideology that they follow that is like different to another Ooh, this is when i'm like not happy that i'm going first <laughs> um i don't think so i would say like RISD is maybe a little i've always felt like it was like a kind of a fine art school although our the name of our school has the word design in it. Um, I think that's because um, of the foundation course that we we did. Um, it's it's kind of even if you're a design major, you need you need, kind of need to know how to draw, and you need it like really. And I think in some schools, if you want to do design, if you want to be on the computer, that's totally fine. RISD was not like that. It was um, it, it was a little bit traditional in some ways. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I don't, it's hard to answer, answer this question, but maybe if I were to, maybe it's that it's a little fine artsy. <laughs> I think, I think for us in London, um, University of the Arts London is definitely big on research. 
Uh, so you need to, if you're studying painting or um, mixed arts, or as as I did, um, graphic and media design, you almost you need to go beyond those creative areas, and you need to be interested either in. I'm just making this up in medicine, biology, psychology, and history, literature, and somehow bring them, bring those disciplines outside of creative world into your work. And I think this is maybe not connected to the school as much, but because it's London, so it's such a vibrant city. Um, I think a lot of the students were into topics such as diversity, sustainability, female empowerment, so all those things that are currently being talked about. And if there was a thread of those in your project, then uh, that was a definite win. Or also, um, also local areas and uh, communities. Uh, and Micah, well, at Micah, we always hear about RISD as like a very intense school, like very technical, like spend a lot of hours doing homework. And then I, I maybe mean, we are less so, I guess, definitely a lot more like conceptual. I don't know. I'm not a very conceptual person, but like people there tend to be more conceptual. Uh, but again, foundation year, we also all have to do it. There's like a 3D class, a 2D class, a digital class. So you kind of have to do everything. And even if you come in like not knowing how to make a sculpture, you are kind of put in the position where you have to like try, you know? So I think a lot of people is, is great because some people come in like, I'm going to be a painter. And then after they work with like wood for the first time, they're like, oh no, their whole life changes and then they start doing like woodworking. Um, so I think that that first year is like a great way to kind of just step outside what you're comfortable with and just try something different. And then you never know where that might lead you. Um, and I think specifically for Micah, it's also like in the middle of Baltimore and we're not kind of, we're not on the outskirts. We are like right smack in the middle of the city. And it's, and I think Baltimore has a lot of history and a lot of like tensions throughout the years as well. Um, and so a lot of the, the people there at the school are very kind of involved in the community and we're kind of like in the community as well. So that's it, sometimes it's like, it's a little rough sometimes like I think the my first year there it was like the Baltimore um, with the Freddie Gray situation so it was like a very different experience and so a lot of that comes in the art as well and a lot of times you see a lot of like activism among the students especially when you're near DC as well sometimes people go to DC and like do a lot of yeah like walks and stuff so I think it's very much also a very social justice the activated campus I guess because we are we are we are in Baltimore and that's like yeah, a big, big part of, I think, also the American experience of being like very vocal and fighting for the people that, that like are, are like not in the same level of privilege as you, yeah. Okay, amazing. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask Christina, uh, because you mentioned this a little bit earlier um, about like liberal arts kind of schools and liberal arts colleges. And Mark, actually, if, if you also apply to any liberal arts colleges, you can talk about this. But um, yeah, Christina and Mark, if, if you did, um, why did you choose to study at an art school over maybe studying at a liberal arts college? Yeah, so for me, um, I just loved to paint. <laughs> um, I also really liked the academics. And so that's why um, I applied to liberal arts schools in a lib and the art program there, thinking that maybe I could double major in something or, um, you know, just, I, I just couldn't let go of the, I was like a little hesitant to let go of the academics. But um, the reason why I chose RISD was because, you know, if you're gonna study art, like I might as well just go all in because if you study at a liberal arts college do, doing an, uh, an art program, so it's, it's a percentage wise, in liberal arts, you do 60% li like liberal arts and then you do 40% art. In art school, it's the other way around. It might even be more, but, um, and someone told me that and I was like, okay, well, that's if that's the percentage, I'm definitely gonna go to, to, to art school. And I actually did have a friend who went to NYU um, who was in, uh, she, she was doing, she was in Steinhardt and she was doing, I think sculpture and she was minoring in a bunch of things. 
Um, but when I went and visited her, I, I really, really saw the difference of um, the amount of art time that you were getting um, was, I think at an art school, it's just, just significantly more. And that's what I wanted. <laughs> Uh, I didn't really apply to a liberal arts college, but I think for me, if I were to leave the country, it would definitely be for more like a specific thing. Because I think a lot of the universities in Singapore are pretty good like for academia, I guess, like math or whatever. Um, but I definitely wanted to do something more art. Uh, I think I do art in high school and then felt like that was something that I wanted to explore. And if I were to leave the country and do that, I would go somewhere that specifically does that, not like a half-half thing. Um, but I think also there's room to be like, go to an art school and then after the first year, you realize it's not for you, you can just transfer out. And I think like there's this, there's this like transfer thing that goes around and people, like I know a lot of students in like my freshman year that left after the freshman year to go to like liberal arts colleges and then also a lot of people that were from liberal arts colleges that decided that they wanted to do art more. So I think there's also, it's not like when you go there, that's the end, you know, there's also still like that, a little bit of wiggle room where you, everyone's still figuring out what they want to do. So uh, yeah, sometimes I think we put too much pressure on they're like, oh, I have to make this decision and then that's it for life. Um, but there's still like that wiggle room in between, yeah. Um, again, students keep, uh, submitting in your uh, questions if you have anything that you want to ask that I haven't already covered. Um, okay, great. So we covered a little bit about like kind of art school. I wanted to talk quickly a little bit about like high school as well um, because, you know, students are currently in high school right now. Um, yeah, so all of you, I think, studied the IB diploma. Um, do you think this prepared you well for higher studies in art? Um, and yeah, that's kind of the question. Yeah, um, definitely. <laughs> um, because art isn't just about um, making, like physically making a painting. You really need to know how to, to think, expand your ideas. Um, and all of, that all of those things kind of come from your other classes. Um, what I liked about the IB diploma was you know it's very rigorous and I think that really geared me to being able to manage my time wisely and just being able to um, have like a good work ethic um, in college. Um, I also think the IB Diploma Art um, I took higher level um, was really good in a sense that um, you know you usually have like a theme and then you kind of explore that theme over the course of two years um and i think that type of deep thinking conceptual starting to think things conceptually um i think really um benefited me when i was in college um, more so than people who took ap art um if i'm just from my personal perspective not that i have anything against it um so yeah <laughs> Uh, okay, my, my answer will be short. Uh, yes, I did. Um, I did IB diploma, but um, in my school, when I when I uh, when I studied it, um, I didn't have an option of choosing any visual classes. So there was no there was no connection between that and my and my further career. Uh, actually, I think studying art was discouraged in my IB class. <laughs> well, I did not know that. Um... Yeah, I did IB like in like 2011, so it was quite a while back. So the format was a little different. Um, so it, it definitely helped because the like our final, I, I mean, it's kind of like a whole year thing, you whole two years thing, you kind of slowly do it your stuff. Not even in just like art, but like all your other classes. You present a lot, which you do a lot in art school because you really have to like present your work and then in like critiques, you have to kind of defend your work a little bit and talk about your work, talk about other people's work. There's a lot of talking, a lot of discussing things and thinking about things. Um, so definitely helped in that. Um, my thing too with like the IB program too, is a lot of emphasis on, I know like 50% was your like sketchbook where you research all your stuff. So a lot of the process um, and also the final exam was like there was an examiner there and you talk them through your art and through your process. So I felt like that was definitely helpful because in art school, you do do a lot of talking and a lot of like, when I first went there, I was very quiet. 
And then after I left, I was like, <laughs> you just, <laughs> because sometimes you gotta like stop yourself from talking. So, yeah. Yeah, it's really nice to hear about like different high school experiences. So Veronica, I actually wanted to, ask you a little bit more about that if that's okay, because maybe some students are in the same position where um, they don't have the option to study uh, art at IB and maybe that's not an option for them. Um, so how would, how did you maybe kind of keep fostering like this uh, creativity and being able to do that even though it wasn't like a school subject? Like how did you keep, like how did you build that passion um, even though you weren't able to study it in, in school? So, um, I mean, just, just being completely honest, I, I try to, um, I, I try to kill it within myself for a while when I, when I was in high school. And when I was in high school, I thought um, the courses that truly mattered were things like studying medicine or studying law. Uh, so when I was in high school, it actually didn't at that time, it didn't really occur to me that I could be a designer. And it was, and it's really, and it's really crazy, honestly, to pick your profession when, when you are in high school. So I would say to any student that doesn't know what they want to do, uh, you, you will at some point or another. So don't worry. Um, so to me, I try to, I try to kill those creative thoughts and it only appeared, um, maybe like one or two years after I finished um, the IB program. So when I was, uh, I was actually studying psychology at the time. And this was when I made the decision to fully pursue art. So it was in a way independent from, from my high school and the thoughts there. So you, sorry, it's, you, it's, quite, it's not as optimistic as I would have hoped, yeah. but <laughs> you know, it yeah. all turned out well in the end. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you finally you got to the creative, creative uh, creativity at the end. After right? a while, yeah. Yeah, after a while. Um, okay, great. And yeah, that's another kind of note for students. Sometimes, like there are kind of pressures that you have to go into, like law or medicine or engineering, if you think they're kind of safer careers. But you know, now there's um, there's the opportunity to pursue your passions, and you should you should definitely try as much as possible and even if you maybe do start off doing something that you um are are maybe feeling like you're forced into or pressured into you can you can change and you can keep going i think mark was also talking about the fact that you can transfer in and out of things so yeah okay perfect um uh, i wanted to ask as well uh kind of more now about like things career focus questions so um, yeah, what is maybe your favorite and least favorite thing about working in the art industry? What would you say from um, your experience? It could be current role, previous role. Uh, uh, yeah, so um, before I started working at this law firm, I was living in New York for a year um, after college. Um, I, I was doing, I was working for an artist, I was teaching art. Um, and later on, I uh, soon after, I, I worked for a big art gallery in New York. Field, but um, when I was working in art, Sorry, Christina, I think we uh, like well. missed. <laughs> Sorry, I think we missed like some of your. Me? Yeah, it kind of just got cut out. So, do you mind like okay. maybe repeating, repeating what I said? Okay, yeah. totally fine. <laughs> um, so, what I can you hear me now? Just just let me know when you can't hear me. Um, so I was just I was just saying that um, right now I'm probably more in the legal field, but when I graduated from college, um, I went to New York and I was living there for a year and I worked for a big art gallery. Um, I was a studio, an artist assistant for uh, an artist in New York. Um, I was also teaching art. Um, so I'm going to talk more a bit about my experience back then versus now, because maybe that seems a little bit more relevant. Um, so my favorite thing about working in the art world was just, it was my dream. I mean, it was, I, I loved art, I loved painting. And it was the first time I was in, in New York, which is like the capital, it's one of the biggest cities that have the most art, you know, and it, I was just so excited. Um, and the gallery that I worked for was really big. And so I got to meet these really, big named artists and um, kind of I kind of got to see all the behind the scenes um, 
work. So how works get put up, how works get put down, how works get sold, who sells them, how do they sell them? Um, just, it was just a huge, huge um, learning experience. And um, it, it was just very, very valuable. Um, the least favorite thing about my job at the time where I was at the bottom of the food chain <laughs> in New York was um, just maybe, I mean, it was also in the context of New York. So um, it, I, I was just getting a lot of, um, how do I say it? Like uh, people, I, because I was facing the general public, I was getting all sorts of comments or just people weren't really nice all the time. And um, there were some Devil Wear Prada moments in my job. Um, so <laughs> that was an experience too. So so those are maybe some of the least favorite things, but the, the good things about my job just absolutely outweighed everything else, so. <laughs> um, so Sorry to hear that, Christina, because I, I suddenly started imagining different scenarios. Um, I mean, there, there are definitely those bad moments, especially in the beginning. Um, I think I think I'm going to start from the bad ones uh, to end on a positive note this time. So um, the bad ones is that in this industry, especially if you're a freelancer, it's very easy to um, be taken advantage of. Um, and a lot of companies, no matter where, what city you're from or where do you work, um, a lot of companies might might just treat you like a tool um, if you're freelancing. So you're coming in, doing your work and going. And it's really important to protect yourself in a way. So always ask what's their overtime policy and always um, discuss the, the, the rates with them. So for example, during COVID, I had one situation um, when I worked until, on one day I worked until 1 a.m. Um, 1 a.m. and that company didn't pay me for that time. So they paid me a normal daily rate, which uh, obviously was ridiculous and you would never want that happening, but um, it wasn't written in a contract. So it's always good to negotiate those kind of things. And, and the best thing about working in the art industry, apart from the fact that, you know, we are all creative. So this is probably what we really wanted to do for a long time. The best thing are honestly the people, because you meet you'll meet so many bonkers characters and everyone has their own story. And there is a person who does generative coding and there is a person who lived everywhere in the world. So you just have all those stories. Uh, and uh, I think those kind of people inspire you and inspire your work. So I think it's always better. And the creatives often tend to be very supportive as well of other creatives. So I think that that kind of weird community of misfits that that's quite that's something i enjoy yeah uh, the, like the freelancer part i totally see that i think like the, the worst and the best part of like being in the art industry is definitely the, like the client so it really depends on your client so i think like being very clear at the start like writing out con your contract writing out like what exactly you need to do because a lot of the times um, I feel like sometimes, especially in Singapore, a little bit, uh, people don't see the value as much in design as compared to like New York. When I was working in New York, the clients there are like, yeah, I'll pay you this much money for like design because it's very big there and it's very, like people see the value in it and people actively pursue stuff like that. So they, they like, they respect it more. Whereas in Singapore, it's very much like, do the bare minimum, that's all I need. Um, and then you want to do something good and that costs more and they're like, no, I just want to pay like the bare minimum. Um, so it's a lot of like having to fight for yourself. And I think when you do something like art and you like art, you take things very personally. So it's also like being very clear, like distancing yourself from, from it. Like don't take everything personally. It's just like, sometimes it's just business and it's just a service. Um, but the best thing too is with like when you have clients that are, that respect you and are really great and like I worked with uh, one of these like 
it's like an Asian American who did like the sparkling water brand, and then I worked with him, and then he's like, you just see the brand go from like, from from like prototype all the way to like they now like everywhere across America. It's like nice to see that, and then he's always like, I remember when I started freelancing for him, I sent him my invoice first, and he was like, make sure you are not undercharging yourself. Make sure you are charging yourself properly. Like I like. You need to run up the hours. Run up the hours. Like don't undercharge yourself. And then I'm like, no client says that. So I think you you really meet like many different faces. And I think, um, yeah, it's just like learning to deal with that and to take the good moments and also take the bad moments. They kind of um, not let everything kind of sink you down. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's. That's really great advice to for students to hear as well um, about you know protecting yourself and kind of making sure that you know this before you're kind of getting into this industry. So yeah, that's that's really great. Um, I just wanted to talk to Veronica and Mark a little bit more about you know uh, digital design and how maybe it's like more different to working in other sectors of art, like maybe more you know, um, for example, Christina is in like painting, you know, um, what what that kind of is like, um, yeah. So I think when it comes to graphic design, um, because it used to be a long, long time ago, it used to be um, about printing a, a lot of the time, but right now the reality is um, even if you are into printing and bookbinding, you will have to do some amount of digital design and some amount of digital work, because even if you're posting an image on Instagram, that's a digital environment. So to be honest, I, I actually don't think right now there is a design with, without that digital part. I think all design is digital to a degree. Um, so yeah that that would be my answer there's there's no separating that um and when, when it comes to my experience even the kind of things that you do for paper there are certain methods and certain um ways of working that you can then convert into the digital world so uh i think i think it's just intertwined both both of those words to be honest yeah, I think a lot of the times the best design is the is the, the best digital design is stuff that you take like physical things and like see how it works physically and then try to apply it digitally. Um, but I think now the benefit of also as opposed to like painting where it's very physical, like you have to paint and be there, is that it's very you can you can like just take your computer and go somewhere else to work. And so it's very flexible in that sense. Like now, even with my freelance, I'm like working with clients in like America and Indonesia and Hong Kong. So it's just like, you have the flexibility to work online, especially now with uh, everything being online, it's a lot easier. Um, so I think, I think that's like, maybe that's the main difference, I guess, with something that's more tactile and something that needs to be uh, like shipped here and there, it's very much a digital thing. And yeah, like most of design now, it's very digital. And most companies are looking for websites or social media posts, which are all digital. So it's, it's definitely, uh, easier in some ways, but also, again, with the, like, sometimes you're stuck in front of the computer like, for like so many hours a day just doing work, um, and it's very hard to separate it because you're not like in the studio and out the studio, like your bedroom is your is your like workspace. So it's good and bad. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, cool. So I kind of now we're getting to slowly the end of our panel. We have about seven minutes left. Students, if you have any last minute questions, don't be shy, <laughs> just send them, send them across. Um, so next, I kind of wanted to maybe end on like some fun kind of questions or misconceptions, stereotypes about like art and kind of working in art um, and, and what it's like. Uh, so the first question that I had, um, or like that, that you know, the, um, Sorry, the first question that I had was, uh, does your work um, influence your own kind of personal style and like how you are or, um, you know, vice versa, does your style influence, like, do you think, do you find parallels in like work and, and what you wear or kind of who you are? 
Um, so I'm a fine artist. <laughs> and so um, my the work I do at the, the law firm, I don't think influences my work, but I think my life and my, my art are kind of like this. And so I've noticed more so right now, actually making work after school is actually a very interesting experience. It's very different from making work while you're in school. Um, I've had a lot more time to really explore um, why I make art and, you know, all of that stuff. And so I've started to, yeah, I'm starting to see like my life kind of creep into to the, the paintings that I make, um, how I make them. And so, so I think the answer is yes for me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Um, for me, it was always in all of my roles, in all of my jobs, um, the, the portfolio I was preparing and how I was recruited was always kind of showing my style and what I care about and the kind of things that I enjoy doing. And then this later influences my, my work. It's probably often in, in recruitment and in graphic design, um, this is what what the employer is also looking for so so someone who has their own approach rather than uh, maybe maybe copying someone else's yeah <laughs> i don't know what else to add but yeah i think it a lot of the times i think also because with like design sometimes you're researching a lot of things and then you like look at stuff online and you're like oh that's cool and then slowly unconsciously like things seep into your life like suddenly you start wearing more color you know because you're like sorry saw this design that's really colorful and then you're like life doesn't have to be black and white all the time um, and so then i think when you absorb so much creative kind of energy from like what you see online and stuff like that it definitely influences like who you are because it's it's yeah you see it everywhere too you're like walking on a, in the subway like oh an ad you're like oh then it kind of it's everywhere so there's no escape so yeah definitely influences it okay cool um okay so i'm gonna end with the same question that we close all of our millie panels with um so this will be the last question for today um, if you could kind of go back and give one piece of advice to your high school self, um, to your younger self, uh, what would it be? Don't worry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think uh, I was really stressed out in high school. If I, I have nightmares about applying to colleges still <laughs> as an adult, it's been over 10 years. Um, but, you know, life has a trajectory and it just things work out, it's, things work itself out, just try your best and um, just don't, try not to stress out about it too much, I think would be my my advice for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I would definitely say that as well. <laughs> um, maybe also don't compare yourself to others um, because your friends might be, one, they might be on, on different paths, but also to um each of you you have your own speeds and so for example for me when I finished my high school um I didn't apply anywhere so I was freaking out because I had this one year basically one empty year when I had to take care of uh, my well-being basically and I was stressing out so much but in the end again like Christina like you mentioned I, I figured it out only at, I wasn't as fast as my friends were so I would say don't, don't compare yourself to others it, it will be okay yeah agree both like don't compare like you there'll always be someone better than you so don't put yourself through that like that's just gonna keep coming up um, but I think one thing too would be oh I had it but now I forgot it's like uh, try try different things I think for me I tried a lot of different things too late, not too late. Like I, I think in senior year, I started doing like DFAT and I did like coding and I did all these different things that I think maybe I should have tried earlier in uh, in, in like school, um, just cause like I really fell in love with that. And then, but I, my like, I already went to an internship at like a design place that offered me a job. So it, it, it was like, I think if I had experimented on things a little bit earlier, I would have discovered like more things that I was interested in and that would have influenced like my trajectory trajectory like now so I think it's like 
don't think you need to like, oh, I'm very good at painting. So I'm just going to focus on painting all the way. Um, just try, just try different things. Like you're very good at painting, but try building something uh, out of like clay or something, you know, just try um, and you'll figure something out that you may not even know you like in the first place. Yeah. yeah. Okay, amazing. I think that's a great way to end the panel. Um, thank you so much to all of the panelists for joining. Each of you gave amazing insights um, into like what it is like to study in art in the US and the UK, as well as um, great advice about career. Uh, so yeah, uh, just huge thank you um, to each one of you and um, to the students that attended as well. If we didn't get to any of your questions and you have anything else, feel free to DM us on Instagram and we'll try and email the question across to the panelists. Um, but uh, other than that, thanks so much uh, to everyone for joining um, and hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks, Aditi. Thanks, thanks for inviting us. Yeah, of course. Yeah.